so um, we have everybody watching. So this session will, is going to be led by you, uh, the uh, AFC Executive Director of Financial Services, Sanjeev Gupta, and my good friend. And I think it's an opportunity to find out how one can partner with AFC. These are interesting times, not just for Africa, uh, but they are for AFC as well, because AFC before COVID and before everything was already going through a transformation and uh, and 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 um, uh, an almost a philosophical call uh, evolution of ecosystem investing and so on. So we want to hear a little bit about who is AFC and what it means to partner. Now, if for infrastructure, we need to be a very important catalyst for Africa to build back from COVID. 19 from the ravages of the social economic fabric that we're seeing every single day on the continent and we've also got this idea of this free trade zone the afc fta which is still a dream that is very much alive and it's infrastructure as we heard earlier in the earlier session that's going to facilitate intra-africa trade this is something afc truly believes in and that will accelerate the continent's development so let's over the next hour um show you why afc is the ideal partner in this new age of intra-Africa trade and this brave new future post-COVID-19, you'll hear about new projects and we'll talk about the approach to new projects. Um, and just, I want you to just read AFC's mission, get to get us started, their mission. AFC's mission is to integrate African economies through infrastructure. Utilizing their ratings, one of the highest in Africa, AFC can mobilize credit into Africa's infrastructure projects that boost intra-Africa trade at a cost more competitive than that which is available to project developers. So let's, I'll now hand over, um, he's not going to do a presentation, but he will freestyle it. Sanjeev, it's all yours. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mark, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, uh, strange times where I suppose uh, each one of us are in different continents, never mind different cities. Um, yeah, so as you so uh, sort of eloquently pointed out, Mark, uh, when it comes to partnership as a concept or as a means of operating on the African continent, I think AFC epitomizes partnership. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know AFC, AFC was actually created 13 years back as a partnership, a unique partnership, actually, which basically created a foundation for African governments to work with the African private sector and global private sector to look into finding solutions for Africa's infrastructure deficit. It was a very much an experiment, Mark, when it was created, but over the years it's evolved into what is a fairly successful and a very proud story to relate to because Today, what are we? We are an A3 rated institution, the second best credit rated institution on the continent. We've invested across 33 African countries, deployed in excess of $7.2 billion during this period. And we have been effective in developing infrastructure projects, industrial projects, energy projects, and also supporting Africa's core sector, which is the natural resources side. And obviously, we haven't done it alone. As much as the founding fathers created the framework for us to have this very, very uh, optimal partnership between African public sector and African private sector, we had to work with other partners. And, and you yourself alluded to it, that the first partnership that we needed and we got early on was a partnership of global capital. Right? I mean, global capital through the DFIs, through the global capital markets, through interest from strategic investors came in and worked with us. Secondly, the partnership of know-how, because when you develop anything in Africa or anywhere for that matter, you need to make sure that you're using the right technology, you're going to have the right o &M in place, and you're going to have the right risk mitigants structured into the, into the model. And again, that means working with people who have done it before. And that's the other partnership. What has also been interesting for us, Mark, when it comes to partnerships is that we have systematically worked and been able to work so far, as I said, with 33 African governments. And that is no mean feat to go across the continent, different cultures, different traditions, different languages, different laws, different stages of economic development, different trade legacies, the point that you were making in the earlier debate. Uh, different friendships that African governments have formed over the years. 
And for us to be the single unifying force and be able to work with them is representative again of the need for partnerships and how well this kind of worked for us. And I think in today's COVID world, Mark, this word partnership assumes a huge significance, huge, because uh, without meaning to be overly critical or controversial, it is true, isn't it, that we today have, to a lesser or higher degree, a little bit of an absence of global leadership in confronting what is probably the modern world's biggest crisis. Uh, we have a singular lack of a global vision to tackle this, right? And that is why organizations like AFC have to make sure that the African continent, which has the opportunities, has the challenges, and has the increased risks because of COVID, is not forgotten. And it, 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 it still reflects what it has always been, a land of opportunities to create jobs, to create industries, and most importantly, to make commercial returns. I mean, this world today, Mark, uh, it always was, even before entering COVID, was flush with liquidity. And it had record levels of negative yielding um, liquidity sloshing around global financial systems. And the fiscal stimulus and the monetary stimulus has only increased it exponentially. And again, it's our job to see whether we can create those collaborations for investors to see Africa not just as a safe haven, because investing is not about safety. Investing is about arbitraging between risk, working with the right people, and achieving the commercial objectives around which the risk return re reward pays off. And that's why AAC is, 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 is the institution that we hope that the global world will look at and work with when it comes to developing and investing in Africa. The Nordics is a particularly unique and an interesting collaboration for us, Mark, therefore, because in many ways, the Nordics represents, I call it a region, which has been extremely adept at managing differing geopolitical tensions. It has been very, very adept. And there is some learning there for the African continent. Great peacemakers. How do you work and find a way to work exactly? within mm. conflicting and inconsistent geopolitics. Do you the think there's an opportunity, the before you go yeah. on to that, do you think there's a, a unique opportunity in these unusual times to, to really create that bridge between the Nordics and the Nordic investment and the Nordics, no, Nordic companies seeking partners and Africa and the AFC is that bridge? Exactly, because that's what I was coming to, that if you look at then the core expertise and the core industries, Resources being one, logistics being another, port transportation being another one, R&D, tech industries, all of these have opportunities in Africa with this young population, with the huge amount of landmass that needs to be connected. And remember, there is one other commonality, the sparseness of the population, the lack of density of mm. people. In Africa is a huge landmass which is dense which is actually sparsely populated, a bit like the Nordics. So again, how do you build effective, commercially viable infrastructure when you don't have the same amount of density like you say you have in India? So that's why to us, collaboration with the Nordic region makes so much sense. And I think, Mark, it perhaps would be appropriate for me to bring in some of my fellow panelists into yeah. the discussion at this moment, at this stage, Jens, I was listening with great interest to your debate earlier on. Um, and as Mark, uh, the moderator, secretly told me that you guys had a sixth love on it. Um, <laughs> you, you, you whipped the opposition, as they call it. Yes. But, but more importantly, Jens, uh, commercial returns aside, one of yeah. the points that we always talk about when it comes to Africa is that it's not about looking at it linearly. Risk gets reduced when the whole ecosystem develops, right? Yeah. Uh, one thing feeds off the other. Infrastructure needs a demand. Demand needs infrastructure, yeah. if you kind of look at it that way. Mm -hmm. so, and I know that AP Muller has been, has been extremely uh, visionary in its approach to Africa from that context. Can you just tell us a little bit about what made you guys think that way and, and maybe give some live examples 
of what economic beneficiation really means. Yeah, so so delighted to do it. First of all, thank you for for having us here, and we very much like these events where we can open openly discuss sort of how to how to uh, make good investments in Africa. But I think yeah, from from our side, I mean, we, we sat down about four four years ago, and and uh, together with the foundation that has a controlling stake in the in the trans transport company, figured out how can we sort of approach Africa in a slightly different way. Uh, mm -hmm. Africa really raises. African strategies in private equity and intra typically raise about three, four billion dollars a year. That's a lot of money, um, but in, in this context of capital markets, it, it's very, very tiny. Deal flow has been sort of historically quite, quite slow, with a few sort of scant exceptions. But they typically sort of center around some of the uh, larger economies and more, uh, more benign playing fields like Egypt, South Africa, Morocco. So, so. We really then took a look at what, what has the MERS group and its ports business and logistics business done over the last, over, well, past 100 years that MERS has operated in Africa across 52 countries with, I believe, it's more than 13,000 employees. How have they been successful to operate in, uh, in frontier territories uh, to the high standard that the, uh, the family ethos requires, but also might be making good returns? And it's really around as we sort of touched a little bit before this kicked off, around these ecosystems, around uh, looking at uh, symbiotic commercial relationships and partnerships where you leverage off um, uh, commercial cash flows rather than government balance sheets. And um, mm -hmm. we, we can sort of perhaps sort of talk about a couple of examples. I mean, one of them is um, uh, a port we, uh, we, we partnered up with AFC and Olan in, in Gabon. Actually, two ports. Uh, one is um, a mineral export port, which is basically taking uh, manganese, which is probably some of the cheapest manganese to produce in the world, transports it all the way out to a port, and then it gets shipped off to um, to manganese smelters around the world and used for steel production. Now, I think one of the unique approaches that I would, we really have to give credit to to AFC and Olan because we came in at a later stage of this opportunity, but it's very simple to build the port. It's very simple to have a sort of piece of concrete and a couple of cranes ready for when a customer show up. But the real issue here is dealing with the logistics all the way upstream into in in country where you have rail which has uh, poor quality. You need to manage rolling stock. You need to manage locomotives. And think what we've done there jointly is we basically operationally taking control of that whole value chain all the way up to the mine, and hence creating a premier product for. Uh, mines that don't have the scale to build that in, uh, sort of uh, integrated infrastructure themselves. And from, from a, a pure business point of view, where we sit, we then get much more comfort around that these uh, wagons with manganese will show up on time and hence we'll get paid on time the manner we give risk the cash flows. I think similarly, um, the next door is you have a general cargo port which feeds off the um, NCOC special economic zone, which, which uh, I think one of the good cases where, where Gabon, as a leading country, said that we need to start beneficiating and processing our own raw materials. Uh, Gabon has um, world-class timber, uh, historically has been chopped down and shipped off to factories and made into furniture and, uh, and um, veneer and any kind of wooden products. But, um, Gabon introduced an export ban, which then basically forced people to move industry into Gabon. Um, Olam and uh, AFC was quite visionary building an economic zone there, which then I think we touched uh, touch earlier, earlier on has so many different companies. Um, and uh, I've been there and seen some of the furniture that's been made. And I mean, there are there are tables there that go for ten thousand pounds at a at a Harrods store. This is high quality products. And and I think the those are some really really good examples on how you can take um, a raw material export industry. And create a uh, more, uh, more, uh, uh, create, retain more of the value creation in country. But Jens, you know what you said is is exactly the point that was being made earlier. That there is a need to create economic activity. There's a need to create uh, an ecosystem that feeds off each other. But yeah. uh, you know, Per, let me come to you now because obviously, uh, whilst what Jens said makes a lot of sense and is important. The core of Africa, to a large extent, is still resources, isn't it? And resources still needs to be uh, invested in, developed, hopefully, beneficiation or processing created out of it so that 
the actual earnings coming out of it is enhanced and traditional resource players has to feel attracted towards the continent, right? So from your point of view, Per, how did you look at Africa when you made those decisions to get in to what are very orthodox and old world sectors? Yeah, thank you very much for for having me, Sanjay. Uh, I have to say it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be in this in this debate, and particularly with the AFC, who has been really really a tremendous partner for us. I would say. Um, so we we started looking at. Um, I mean, from the Acker side, we've been in Africa for decades through Acker Solutions, for example, delivered the largest subsea project ever in Angola. Uh, and also our other businesses have a significant presence here. But from the EMP side, we really started looking into Africa in 2017 when uh, we um, did a deal with Hess in Norway. Uh, they invited us to look at uh, at um, their business in Ghana. For various reasons, they were divesting assets globally. Uh, we took a look in, on the asset and we realized that we had a slightly different view on the asset and the opportunity and decided to, um, to, to proceed. And, since then, we actually we have done a lot of things. I mean, we have drilled uh, five wells across the two blocks. We have one block where Acker is involved and one block where only TRG, the main owner of Acker, is involved. And we really were able to prove up another 100 million barrels in the Hess block. So we, we saw an opportunity. Uh, we were able to add value to it. And, um, and, um, and, and, and we see a lot of opportunity, really. So I think for us, it's been a, uh, we do obviously acknowledge the risk, I think. There are things to think about. You need to be patient when doing business in Africa, but we also see tremendous opportunity on the uh, on the natural resources side. And really Tell us a little more about those, Per. Where are you seeing those tremendous opportunities? Because no, my I mean, eyes, my ears are perking up. <laughs> no, I mean, if you look at the sector in Ghana, I mean, it's really a it's really a, a super underexplored uh, uh, oil province. You know, you have three fields producing, uh, but you have uh, uh, really not drill that many wells. So from the EMP side, we think that you can really uh, develop significantly more fields. It's deep waters. So having experience from deep water EMP, I think is critical, but that's exactly what we have in Acre, through our subsea experience in Acre Solutions and through Acre BP. And the one thing we do not have in Acre is, uh, you know, um, the EMP business in Africa particularly, but that's why teaming up with AFC has been so great because uh, having someone who actually knows Africa inside out and someone who knows and understands the risks and um, characteristics of oil and gas, you know, it's really made all the difference for us. So, so uh, but you make a very important point, which allows me to actually raise something with Jens. Jens, you know, we, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks, the extraordinary amount of liquidity that's sloshing around the global systems, right? Earning negative yields. Uh, but we're still having difficulty, as you know, as a continent to attract capital, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how do you see, therefore, the game changing, given that you guys have a strategic interest in wanting mm -hmm. to be in Africa, and you have players like us who have a mandate and a development interest in, in Africa? How do you see that last bit of the challenge breaking down? And that is that perception around risk or perception around challenges that makes risk unpalatable. Because yeah. we need to attract those capital, don't we? I think it's, it's, it's if you think supply and demand, right? So yes, there is a lot of capital floating around. There's a lot of capital chasing for yield. Uh, deal, take, deal sizes are going bigger and bigger in, in OECD infrastructure, the wall returns are, 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 are contracting. I think the, the why isn't that capital moving into Africa? And I think there's sort of a couple of couple of components into that. One is, um, as we talked about earlier during the day, the the perceived risk versus the real risk, and it is there is there is a a, a gap. Uh, Moody's used to publish a, a study where they looked at default rates for portfolio finance around the world, and and um, Africa was looking coming out very very favorably in that study. So I haven't seen that study for probably two years hmm. and um, uh, there's certainly I mean there is stress on the system now worldwide and that that permeates through Africa as well so so as uh, so I'm sure there are some challenge projects I think the the other part of it is is uh, is regional complexity I mean if you look at population look at geographic size look at uh, raw material production and, and and the pure potential of Africa is tremendous however in terms of GDP um, uh, still still lagging behind I just looked up 
this morning, I think the GDP of Ghana is about uh, 66 billion dollars. Germany is about 4 trillion. Now Germany's got 80 million people, Ghana's got 12 million. Which comes to the next point, which is, uh, I think for, for us to engage with the investors that can write meaningful tickets, we need to show that there is ample deal flow to justify that interest. Because there is an education um, process to move to a new continent, whether you go to Latin America, Southeast Asia, UK, in light of Brexit or Africa, uh, you need to become an educated investor because otherwise you end up looking at the deals that other people don't want to do. So, so I think, um, I think, um, and we we looked at. Um, uh, no, Jen, sorry to interrupt you. I buy the demand supply story. Uh, ultimately, capital is fungible. It will find yeah. its way, place where it sort of ultimately belongs. But there are other agendas, right? But I just want to talk to you about this a bit because you coming from the the fossil fuel industry, right? And you know that there is this challenge with with greenhouse emissions and, and, and carbon footprint and, and all the all the challenge that, that the global warming, et cetera, is putting in front of us. And and as an institution in Africa, as you know, uh, we were accredited by the Green Climate Fund, the first ones. We did our recent green bond issuance as well a couple of weeks back. So we're playing our part in it. But we cannot move away from the fact that Africa has still got tremendous sources of fossil fuel, and that still needs to be uh, developed. But how does that reconcile with this demand supply thing that Jens is talking about? Well, because there's clearly a demand and there is a supply. Yeah, absolutely. but how will that agenda play out? It's a, it's a very good question. And I think that uh, what, we, uh, what we need to recognize is that fossil fuels will continue to play an important role in, uh, in the years to come. Uh, there's no uh, getting away from that. Ocra as a system, uh, you know, we are also going into renewables, but we also believe strongly in oil. And I think, uh, I think uh, um, uh, there is a lot of resources which have been developed in Africa, but there's probably much more that haven't been developed. Uh, and it's all about, you know, um, using the years we have now to make sure that we can get uh, projects on stream. Um, and the oil company has to do what they can to make, you know, projects cost efficient uh, so that uh, we're able to have, you know, low break evens which are competitive in a low oil price environment. But also um, governments um, have to um, recognize that they are competing for capital on a global scale. And that capital is probably structurally uh, uh, becoming a smaller pool as uh, the majors and others are diversifying into renewables. So it's going to be a competition for, for capital. And um, I think it's important that oil companies and the governments together work on how they can make project more sustainable, being improving projects or improving or looking at more balanced uh, incentives and fiscal terms and, and what have you. Um, but, 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 time. but, but per, I just could follow on point to you. Gas is something that has been flared out, right, all the mm -hmm. time. And, and that itself has its emission challenges and, and footprint challenges. Surely there is a case to be built around developing gas in a more structured way rather than uh, getting locked into this other debate about mm -hmm. greenhouse? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are definitely potential in, in gas and, 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 uh, um, and, and I, I agree. I think that's part of the solution. I think the picture is much more nuanced than you can sometimes see in, in, the, in the media. Okay, Jens, I'm going to ask a question, but before that, there is a comment on the chat box from Hassan Churabi who is actually asking a very practical question that given the location, given the proximity, aren't Nordic countries at a relative disadvantage um, in terms of engaging on the African continent? It's, it's a, I, I can try to answer that. I think it's, uh, it's a good question, uh, but I think it's a little bit playing to your strengths. I mean, uh, a Nordic country like Norway has its uh, certain strengths being sort of shipping, being uh, oil. And in these sort of sectors, I think we clearly do have an advantage of investing in Africa. And, and in a country like Ghana, you have even seen that um, the Norwegians has been instrumental in developing the regulatory framework. Uh, I mean, some of the lawyers who speak to Norway has actually been writing the laws in Ghana. Um, um, so, so I do think that uh, the Norwegian uh, uh, players do have an advantage in certain industries, and, and one of them is definitely oil and gas. And that's not only on actually extracting the oil, but it's also in helping develop the service sector, uh, which is a, 
quite a big sector in Norway with some of the leading players globally. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, in the right sectors, I do think we have a, a big advantage. Jens, let me move to you. Slightly mm -hmm. different topic, uh, area of discussion, but again has a big impact on your ecosystem strategy. Uh, legacy trade practices, right? We know yeah. that the African continent still has, I mean, you yourself mentioned some of the tariff structures which discourage processing. Uh, how are we going to handle that so that beneficiation is not thwarted by global trade protocols that African countries individually may have difficulty in um, breaking down? Yeah. It's a really good question. I mean, uh, I think sort of the free, free trade convention that, that's, that's coming on is is a great concept, and we'll see how it plays out. It's going to take some time, but but I think the the um, the uh, inter-African trade, I think some other mentioned earlier, represents about fifteen percent across Africa. You look at similar stats in the Americas, Europe, and America, and you're probably in the 60s, 70s. So so there is there is merit in in improving in, inter country trade on the continent. But I think you also just got to recognize that we are dealing, I mean, it's 15% of smaller economies as well. So you got to, we need to find a way to break into sort of the big consumer markets. And I'm, I'm probably more worried about the European Union there than perhaps even the US and, and China, which has in different ways taken a very more, more, more open approach. Um, to, to me, I, I think it is, I'm less worried about tariffs and, and, and that, which I think we can probably find a way to deal with. And, and I think um, I made sort of a flippant remark about Belgian chocolate earlier this morning. And, and I think um, I'm sure we get the same quality for 20% less the price if it's made in uh, Abidjan than if it's made in Brussels. So, so I think it's more around just building the ecosystem and, 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 and transferring uh, skills operations down there. And again, picking up the example on on, on NCOC and the uh, and the Arise sort of broader group of companies. What's happened there is you start with moving in a number of expats that have the skills, you train up local labor, and, and I think as we, we've done on Arise Port Logistics, we're now basically materially reduced the number of expats. So insourcing skills, um, putting in place infrastructure, which is power, utilities, security, um, and access to trade finance, um, which I know is something you're working on as well, is uh, are practical steps you can implement without having to wait for a five-year World Trade Organization change of tariffs. But, but you he heard Jens talking about skills. We also heard Professor Paul Collier talking about productivity on the African continent being a major challenge. Uh, given the work you guys have done over the years in Africa, what have you done in terms of approaching the skills gap? No, it's a, it's a good question and it's, it's something that we are very passionate about. I mean, uh, uh, coming from, uh, um, unlike all the other oil companies in uh, Africa, we are actually coming from it with a, uh, with a mindset of a group mentality where we have obviously Acker Energy and Acker BP as the main oil companies, but we do also have all the service companies that cover most of the actual value chain uh, being sort of engineering, fabrication, um, equipment. So for us, I think we actually are in a quite unique position to help uh, demolish transfer and it's something we essentially think about every day. I mean, we do a lot of uh, initiatives like supporting um, the AOGC uh, uh, projects led by the Petroleum Commission in Ghana. We do a lot of in-house training. Uh, uh, we have set up entities to help uh, the local industry so it's something that we are very passionate about and, and we're trying to do really all we can and i do think we actually are in a quite unique position in the oil sector given that we have the whole you know group um we're coming from so many different angles not just the oil company side okay jens you want to add anything more from your side on the whole skills gap before i ask you another question on something <clears> else no, I, I think the uh, we're building a, a, a small um, gas capture project in Nigeria uh, where we're basically mm. taking gas that otherwise would be flared, compressing it and displacing diesel for power generation because of uh, just a reflection of the weakness of the grid. Um, a lot of the local labor work has been done by the local community and that serves two purposes. One is um, 
you basically integrate the community and be you and start uh, creating local jobs and you you start training training skills as well so so i think it is it is important i mean local content is a uh, is a uh, topic that is being introduced across the continent uh, for for good good reasons and well intended it's challenging to implement in practice sometimes but but um, but uh, we uh, we very much welcome and seek local partners and uh, and uh, that that is a way to also make sure that we get the best resource in the right place but but question for both of you uh, you talked about the need for local partners you also applauded AFC for the role it plays uh, so thank you for that but both of you work in sectors which require a huge amount of uh, sovereign level support and sovereign level uh, engagement. What has been your experience? Uh, feel free to tell us how you think it should improve, where you think it's been particularly frustrating, and where you think it's been great moments as well. Do you want to start here? And I'll, uh, but, yeah, I think you know it's a uh, it's a. Uh, You've been put on the spot there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a very good question, and I think it's you know. Uh, it's as Sian said, it's, it's uh, local content is is key uh, to develop uh, the industry in the various countries. Um, it's not always easy uh, because uh, often, uh, not speaking particularly to Ghana, but on a general scale, it is it is have a vision and ambition of where you want to go. Uh, but then it's all about taking the steps in the right sort of industrial pace. Because if you start out with uh, uh, sort of too high requirements. Um, you might not be able to build the robust industry you want. I mean, we have already incurred a significant cost drilling five deep water wells, one which was actually the deepest in Ghana ever. Uh, and we've used that uh, through, you know, a lot of uh, local companies. Um, and it has worked, um, it has worked uh, reasonably well. It's not always easy, uh, but I think it's a, uh, it's really needs to be a partnership, you know, with the, uh, with the authorities and with the national oil company um, to make sure that, you know, at the same time you balance the state's desire to build the local industry, which, which we will recognize and support, uh, while allowing for efficiency and cost competitiveness. Because if you end up with a, um, with a, um, a cost level or scheduled risk, which impacts the project, that, that uh, doesn't serve the purpose. So it's, it's sort of, it's always about balancing those two. And I think so far we've been able to strike the right balance. And I think we, uh, and ultimately, when we get to that idea on, on the PECOM deal, which we are actually working with them, and, and frankly speaking, it's looking really prom promising. Um, that will be obviously be one of the, the key things to agree with the government. And, and we're working on sort of a, quite a comprehensive uh, and balanced plan there, uh, which we are sort of excited to move, uh, move on with. Thank you. Pep. Jens, before you comment on that, I would actually like you to add something mm -hmm. I know you guys have been very good at, which is to proactively engage with government to bring yeah. policy environment into a more conducive state. So <clears> just, <throat> just, just comment in that context, the role you've played. Yeah, so, so, so uh, Mersk uh, and, and Bavert, we sort of share the same values, even where think of us as a distant cousin, it's, it's um, ethics, governance, uh, transparency are, are, are core values. To, to what we do, and um, and um, we are operating in high risk jurisdictions in Africa as pertains to other 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 uh, regions as well. But I think uh, going in and engaging quite early on about stakeholder management, about policy, about uh, what is an investable framework is is quite 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 important. I think um, uh, I think one of the proudest moments of my fellow partners when they were at MERSC was. Uh, uh, starting the construction and finishing the construction of the Tema port in, uh, in, in Accra. A $1.2 billion investment, probably the largest onshore foreign direct investment in Ghana, with a consortium backed by, by, uh, by IFC and, uh, and a number of other investors. So I think, I think um, proactively bridging to sort of what, what makes it work locally, because you need to solve the problem. You can't come with a pre-described solution that worked in Germany in the 1930s or in Norway in 1910. You need to adapt something uh, to, that actually works in, in Ghana and, and find a revenue model that works in that, in that context. It, it's something we spend a lot of time on and we're doing that on, on, a, on a road project in, uh, in Ghana, which would be an extension of this port. The government doesn't have a balance sheet to come 
with a revenue shortfall guarantee and we're working with the various stakeholders to uh, come with a different proposal that makes it investable as far as foreign investors are concerned because it needs foreign direct investment while at the same time not putting this burden on the, on, on the local government. Just sort of finishing up on the point on, on, on local partners, um, it is exceptionally important, but it's also, it is quite difficult, right? Because uh, in some places, and we're looking at something in Northern Africa in the, in the grain import uh, industry, where you can find a good industrial partner that is well capitalized, um, that we both see our eye on, on how we want to run and grow the business. But there are not a lot of large, well capitalized industrials in, in Africa. So, how do you then bring in local partners? And then you also need to, of course, sort of run the rule over that. This, these are very, I mean, the, the, the business communities and political communities often overlap, which then creates um, challenges about sort of who is a so called politics first person and who's not, which then means that the pool you got operated in can very quickly become quite, uh, quite small. But it's. Uh, it's something we spend a lot of time on to make sure we get the right solution for each project. There's no generic solution uh, that works. But uh, yeah. so, 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 Jens, Pierre, coming to you. I mean, we've talked about partnerships as, mm. as obviously a way of going forward, and we've talked about the government, the private sector, the global funding community, the global corporates. What about local communities? How do you work with them so that you do manage their concerns, their anxieties? and sometimes the real issues that come with uh, the sort of industry that you're in. Uh, yeah. The, the, um, the, sorry, the, Jens, I'll come to you after, after yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. yeah, so I think, I mean, just to, to add to the last question as well, I think that slightly different from, from Jens, who is sort of looking at more countries. I mean, we are, I think we are, you know, I, I think we do recognize that we are quite lucky to be in a country like Ghana when it comes to the oil industry, even though it's not a big oil industry, it, it has been pre field developments, there is a lot of competence in place already, and it is a, you know, very highly educated population and so on. So, so we do think we are quite lucky in that respect. When it comes to, you know, the, the communities, this is very important for us. And um, in, uh, in Ghana, it's, you know, we do have the uh, um, investment goal is sort of a, a key community, which is uh, where all the field developments are essentially uh, located at. Uh, and our field is sort of a hundred plus kilometers away from the coast, but there is a lot of fishermen and so on and so forth. And for us, we do a lot of um, stakeholder management there, uh, spend a lot of time in the region, making sure that we are actually aligned with the, with the local community. And of course, uh, on the CSR side, um, we do, uh, we do um, spend a lot of um, not only re resource and money on CSR, but a lot of our time on it as well. Uh, so making sure that we do have a good footprint and take responsibility locally is is definitely a uh, it's definitely a key priority for us. And I think in the long run, it's the only sort of sustainable way. It's a risk mitigant, isn't it, Jens? How have you dealt with it, the local issues? Because some of your ecosystem-based strategies involve the locals heavily, right? No, and, and um, you often can come into stakeholder management at sort of various levels, whether it's sort of federal, state, local municipalities, and, and local landowners. And I mean, often, uh, often there are sort of uh, other uses of, of land that are not necessarily called legally documented, but still it can be as emotional. I think to me, I mean, just sort of building up what Pesheto said, uh, it's really important to get in early on and, and be proactive. Once you've got diggers on the site, then it's too late to, to, to figure out if there's a problem. Then you're basically in repair mode rather than prevent, prevent mode. Um, um, so so I, th these are often large transformational projects that have a lot of impact. And uh, there's obviously a consultation process to go through to make sure that on balance it's for the greater good. But, but there will always be somebody who will be adversely affected and need to make sure that that is, that is proactively that you seek input, seek guidance, try to try to find solutions to also to mitigate the uh, the impact as much as possible. Per, uh, you you kind of uh, probably dug yourself this question when you said you see tremendous opportunities, but you you are still concentrated in one part of Africa. What's happening? Yeah. Why? Yeah, good question. But I think it's if you. I mean, if you look at it from the wider Africa context, I mean, we are uh, we are in fact present in uh, quite a few countries in Africa. So I think this is on the EMP side. It's really where we are 
located in one country only. And for us, it's all about, you know, uh, building a, uh, not only do we think that uh, Ghana is a particularly interesting country. I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, stable uh, democracy. Uh, it has a lot of resources which are uh, undeveloped. It has a lot of exploration potential to find more resources. Uh, and it has, you know, proven to be a, to be a very stable, stable and good place to do business. So that's why we picked Ghana. I mm -hmm. think for us, it's. I'm not saying that we're going to be in Ghana forever, uh, or not. No, you're going to be in Ghana forever, but you're going to be in more countries. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Yeah, exactly. I'm saying that we are we are long term in Ghana. I'm not saying that we're necessarily not going to move into other countries. But for us, it's to build a sufficient scale to be able to apply the best practices we see operationally, like we've done on Marco BP on the NCS, we do think that having critical mass in one country is key. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's why we are essentially on the EMP side in two countries, Norway and Ghana. Uh, so that's the, okay. that's the starting point. Jens, uh, what's, what's inspirational about your strategy? You know, you heard there, they're looking at other parts of the world. You are, as Epimolar, a big partner to ASC. Uh, we have proven case studies to know the model works. Mm -hmm. So what's the next big excitement you're going to inspire us with? It's a good question. We're obviously working on a number of things, including expanding the uh, this, this ecosystem uh, strategy together with you guys. Um, I would say um, uh, we are looking at something in, uh, in sort of the um, call it the grain import infrastructure uh, segment. Um, we are looking at um, uh, something in the uh, captive renewable space, which hopefully we will uh, be able to conclude fairly, fairly soon. Which again is is following the same ethos and strategy, which is take a look at which are the sort of relatively credit worthy off takers, consumers, customers you can find in the country, uh, and have you build infrastructure around that that then then can have sort of multiplier effects. Um, so, so, um, so, so I'm going to before we end reiterate a couple of points I made early on so that you can comment back on it. Because from my point of view, this conversation that we are having with you uh, under the auspices of NABA is not a random one. Because we do believe that the Nordics have a huge relevance and a particularly differentiated approach that really should be a big plus for Africa. And remember what I said, it's about your knowledge in sectors that are core to Africa, be it resources, uh, be it transportation, logistics, ports, uh, etc. I also spoke about your ability to manage geopolitics better than most, which I think there are lessons to be learned. And also we talked about low density, big sort of expanse of land and how does infrastructure work and mm -hmm. work commercially and viably so. But given that, what do you think African countries and African companies should look towards in terms of a wider engagement from the Nordic area? Why aren't we doing more in the service sector, for example, be it education or be it healthcare or be it IT, be it R&D generally? Do you think that's, that's an opportunity? Both of you, please, Per, you can go first and then Jens can come in. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it's a huge opportunity. I think uh, Africa is, uh, if you look to where, for example, the, the population growth is going to come from uh, after eventually China's population growth will slow down, it's countries like Nigeria, it's uh, Africa, West Africa. So I think it's a huge opportunity. And I think, I think really here is an area where I think uh, um, AFC can really play a key role. I mean, as I said, for us, it's been a, having AFC has been a complete game changer for us. So, so using uh, companies like AFC to, to help guide on both sides on the opportunity set, I think is, I think is key. And I think there are, there are sort of a plethora of opportunities uh, where, Thank you. Uh, where you can work together. There is a question from Lini, which actually asks the same thing. How can they work with AFC? So maybe we can take that offline. Jens, please comment quickly on the wider set of opportunities before we wrap up. Yeah, so so the, I mean, the, the, there are there are a number of untapped opportunities. I mean, one one area which we looked at briefly is uh, cold storage chains. So basically, how do how do you basically transport, uh, say, food uh, across for two three thousand kilometers in Africa and building logistics systems around that? There's a lot of companies like uh, like Damco, which also part of Maersk, uh, can can uh, can offer to 
to support there. The same thing goes for healthcare, medic, med, uh, medicines, um, IT services, which uh, are, are so. The, the, there's ample opportunity, specifically how to engage them. And I think I think uh, AFC can be a good entry point, um, and I think you can give the uh, give the regional context and then help tailor a business plan to make sure it's not something that looks great in Oslo, but it's not uh, implementable in Nairobi. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. I think the partnership that AFC has formed with each of your respective businesses is an important one for us, not because we were successful in what we have done so far, but because we know we can do so much more based mm -hmm. on the same template. And that's make, that makes it exciting for AFC. But I think the broader message we can all agree to is that there is huge amounts of synergy between the two regions, the Nordic region, Nordic businesses in Africa and Africa's opportunities. And we do hope that through NABA and people like ourselves, we can spread that message better so that we can all mutually benefit uh, out of hopefully a great set of commercial and commercially viable opportunities. Uh, any final comments from any of you before we wrap up? I would like to say th thank you for having uh, for having uh, Ocker and us. And, and, uh, it's an exciting period for Ocker working on the revised concept of PECA, which I'm sure we will be successful on maturing a very robust project together with AFC. So thank you for the support and uh, look forward to the continuation. Thank you, Pierre. Jens, any last comments? Before we I just echo that. I mean, the uh, we we uh, I always keep getting asked, sort of, what did you do in your life to end up doing infrastructure in Africa? We actually did it by choice. So, um, so there there is there is a real opportunity here to do well by doing good. I think there's some of the parameters we need to work on, which is sort of the, uh, the repeated cost of capital and a few other uh, perceived perhaps versus uh, real risks. But uh, so we really appreciate this opportunity here to discuss it with you and. Thanks again for the invite. Thank you so much and good luck and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.